So Walt Whitman's song and myself is in 52 uh, sections. I call them cantos. Uh, and there's no way that we can do justice to all 52 in the time we have. But, but I thought it would be good for us to try to understand Walt, particularly in the context of Emily Dickinson. These are two proto-modernists. They're heading toward breaking the rules of conventional official verse culture of the 19th century. Formally, they're doing very different things, but they're somewhat equally breaking the rules. And, uh, but Walt does it in a very different way. So let's, let's start right from the beginning. The first two lines, I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume, you shall assume. What's positive and happy and good, Max, about that, before we get to the doubts about it? What's so great about it? It's, uh, it's full of self-esteem. It's, it's, uh, it's about himself. It's about being proud of, of who he is and, uh, and what he thinks and celebrating that, celebrating his, his being a human being. And it's about the I. It's about the first person pronoun, which is given romantic poetry's allowance for the I, not completely new, but it's perhaps new in its emphasis. This is about him. This is, this is essentially a verse journal, really, a verse diary. I celebrate myself and sing myself. Sing? Anybody want to comment on sing? Amaris? Um, it seems reminiscent of minstrels. It seems like an epic, except this would be an epic with self rather than um, a legendary hero. And singing as opposed to talking or writing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an exuberance, like implicit in singing. And an association get... with poetry in its original state, maybe. The singing, the bardic, the lyric the as in the lyre. Kristen? It's more of a ballad type sing. Although it's the form looser. is not a ballad it's form. It's not a ballad form. form but... right. Balladeering, I guess, yeah. is what you mean. Okay, the downside. I celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume, you shall assume. What an audacious thing for him to say. Allie, where do we start with that? And what I assume, you shall assume. There's a positive and a negative there. Um, well, the negative is, well, you know, according to who? Like, what gives you the right to assume what I would assume? Assume is a really um, interesting word in this context, right? Assumptions. Basic assumptions. We assume the same things. Well, assume could also mean, like, like to make an assumption would be, like, I think this about something, but... To assume something could also mean that you kind of like sort of put it on or like take it in or, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean like to make an assumption about someone. Like you can also like assume a certain attitude or... Ah, as in assuming a position. Sure. Right, so there's assuming a position and when you're talking about Walt, who's sort of omnisexual, there's a certain positioning that's, that's exciting for him. And the position that he has as the writer in connection to you as the reader is it's somewhat sexualized, and so there is an ass assuming a position. And the position he assumes is the same position that you shall assume. So then I loaf and invite my soul. I always found this when I was first studying Whitman. Just It tickled me to think of someone giving himself license or permission to invite himself, as if to say, do you really need, does the self need permission to do something for the self? <coughs> I invite myself, my soul, I learn and loaf, etc. I, now 20, 37 years old, in perfect health, begin. Lovely. Begin. This is the birth of the subject, not the birth of the person or the man, the birth of the subject, of the writing subject, of the language itself. Okay, let's look at the end of section one. I harbor for good and bad. I permit to speak at every hazard. Nature without check with original energy. Let's talk about the phrase original energy. Anybody have a thought about the way the word original works there? Kristen, your thought? Um, original, original in that it's a, it's um, What kind of originality? Let's talk about the origin. The, origin, meaning birth. It's so natural. Just, it's natural. Original. Um, first. Originality. First, unique, legitimate, original, the first, the, the real thing, right? But also, original, originary, origins, bardic, singing, back to basics. Original energy. I'm returning poetry to its expressive origins, I guess he's saying. 
Okay, now we go to Canto 2 or Section 2. And in this section, houses and rooms are full of perfumes. There's an internal rhyme. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe the fragrance myself. I, I know it and like it. The distillation would intox me also, intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. Uh, the atmosphere is not a perfume. It has no taste of the distillation. Later, the sound of the belched words of my voice loosed to the eddies of the wind. So he, d he seems to be OK with perfume ro rooms, but he seems to be better out in the air, the sound of the belched words. So would you think of Emily Dickinson as offering us belched words? <laughs> So what is belched, what, what, what are belched words? Be, the belched words of my voice loosed to the eddies of the outdoor air, the atmosphere, the unscented atmosphere. What's he trying to say? Emily, where, where, where does he stand? What position is he taking? And what does air have to do with poetry? Well, the Any of those of things. Belching words is inherently very artless. Belching is something that is like naturally inarticulate and to right. express yourself verbally and by means of an inarticulate sound is a kind of... A barbaric yeah. yelp, a howl that's going to be very influential. So this is, the un, this is the unesthetic aesthetic. This is the supposedly natural voicing of the body. Yeah, Dave, you were going to say something. That it's also unrestrained. Belch sometimes happens involuntarily. It's, unrestrained. And you it's just let unconstrained, it go. formally as well, the long lines, the repetition the seeming prosaic style, air, breathing, respiration, inspiration. So there's a relation between original, original writing, original poetics, and the belch words loosed, not constrained, but loosed to the eddies of the wind. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, he says at the end of Canto 2. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. Uh-oh. He's really outdoors now. What's he saying? And how do you feel about it? I, mean, I think that's it, a really direct response to, to Emerson. In, the, in Emerson's speech, The American Scholar, he says that, like, Americans can no longer look to what people before us have written and said. Like you should read and you should you should be educated, but it's it's time now for for Americans to make their own cultural stand, make their own cultural contributions. And I think Whitman's really responding to that. Yeah, it's like primary experience, going out there and doing it for yourself primary instead of experience. relying on looking through a window at someone else doing it, like Emily Dickinson might want to. So firsthand experience is a guide to reality. This is, a, this is a Whitmanian hallmark. And this is going to become a problem throughout modern poetry. When we get in chapter 8 of this course to John Ashbery's poem, The Instruction Manual, he parodies this whole idea that first-hand experience is a guide to, in this case, the town of Guadalajara, where he, 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 he <coughs> mocks the idea that we can actually know something about Guadalajara and that these aren't words. In fact, what Walt has written here about secondhand knowledge is secondhand knowledge because it's words. And in fact, the specter of books is the leaves of grass, the book itself. So there's all kinds of theoretical impossibilities with this naive um, I experience and I convey experience. But we love it because he's trying to break free, as you were suggesting in a kind of transcendental way. Section three, Canto three, I love this stanza. There was never any more inception than there is now. I want to ask you all what now means after this. There was never any more inception than there is now, nor any more youth or age than there is now, and will never be any more perfection than there is now, nor any more heaven or hell than there is now. Urge and urge and urge. Max, what does now mean? in this context. Well, this now, is is, now is the poem. He's talking oh, about. You want right to the like, bonus answer. Right <laughs> from the, right, can you give us a prim, more primitive answer? Uh, now would be the, maybe the time of his writing or the time of, of, of that sort the of present, first hand the ninth, experience. The progressive the 19th century present, which Whitman was very interested in. There's that progress, human progress. Good, yeah. And now you can go to your second level answer. 
Or now is also the poem. <laughs> oh, and why do we say that? What does presence mean in writing and language? Well, if, he's, if we're talking about this sort of paradox or theoretical impossibility of, of conveying his experience with words, then he's sort of, um, he's saying that, that the words here, this, this poem, this language is the experience. This is it. This is it. There's never more, I love this, never any more inception, any more creativity, any more birthing, any more origins than there is right here as I write. In a way, that's the same self-referentiality we see in Dickinson. That's the this for occupation sure. this. Nor any more youth or age. We don't look back. We don't look forward. What we do is we have this presence, the presence of this subjectivity, of this writer, of this wall. If you want to look for me, look under your boot soles. I'm there, the leaves of grass. I'm always there. Wherever you look, I'm there. And maybe you just um, going back to the meeting uh, that, of a scene that Anna pointed out. Um, maybe he's encouraging the reader to assume the body of the poem in that sense. So that's sort of undermining that statement. He, neither he nor the reader is assuming anything except for their embodied experience in the world and also in the poem. I like that. No assumptions. Um, I'm here, you're here. The division between reader and writer has disappeared now that the writer is gone and what you have is a text that you absorb. And inception takes place right here. Now means here. It's presence. The presence of the writer. Urge and urge and urge. We think of urge as being the original creativity. But in fact here, the urge is the urge to be here after you're no longer. The, the language itself. <coughs> If we go to Canto V, there's a passage that's what I call metapedagogical. I'm very interested in metapedagogy. Metapedagogy is the, the inclusion of the idea of teaching, how something is taught in the thing itself. And Walt likes to think of himself as a teacher. Loaf with me on the grass. Loose the stock from your throat. What would the stock in your throat be? Metaphorically, I hope there's no real stop, but... Whatever is controlling your thoughts from getting out. Or so preventing, but in preventing you from saying what you want to say. The notion of the voice, an inhibition that's lodged in the throat, the thing that won't let you full throttle to yawp, to squeal, to use a neologism just to, to, or to listen to the world and say it. That kind of, again, naive notion of representation. Loaf with me on the grass. That's, of course, his theme, conceit, the leaves of grass. Loaf with me on the grass. Loose the stop from your throat. Let it out vocally. Not words, not music or rhyme. Rhyme? What's wrong with rhyme? It's Whitmanian? Constraining. It's constraining. Are you, do you want to be Whitmanian for a second? Yes, please. What's wrong with rhyme? That rhyme can often be a stop in the throat. That it can, it it's can, a constraint, can right? prevent you from what you actually want to say because you like, oh, well, you know, this is an A, B, A, B rhyme. I have to like, rhyme this so I can't use the word that I really want to use because it doesn't rhyme. So the long line, seemingly, is the unstopping of the throat. Not rhyme, not music or rhyme I want, not custom or lecture. What? What's custom, what's custom have to do with lecture? Dave? Well, lectures are given in a customary sense. There's a, a specific way of giving a lecture. It's a formulaic way. So what is the idea, what's the lecture as opposed to something else? What, is, what, what kind of conveyance of information is a lecture? What's behind it? What are the assumptions? That there is a speaker conveying a something. Speaker and a listener. And a listener who is. Someone stands, speaker. others sit. Someone speaks, others are quiet. Someone knows, others don't. Someone is, the others aren't yet. That's the custom of knowledge. It's also the custom of subject object relations. It's the custom of subject, speaker, object, reader. It's the custom of writer, reader, and Walt is challenging that somewhat naively, exuberantly, sillily sometimes, challenging the notion that there is someone to tell you what you know. What he really wants to do is crawl inside your brain and your body and find out what you know and speak it for you. Ooh, it's a little creepy. <laughs> Not custom or lecture, 
That's the metapedagogical moment. What we do when we read these poems together is we form a collaborative, collective, close reading. And I have a feeling that if 10,000 people were to read this poem together and collectively interpret it, the interpretation would be better than if one person were to do it him or herself. Not custom or lecture, not even the best. Only the lull I like. Lull? The hum of your valved voice. All right, so lull? Only the lull. Love this word. Only the lull. What's he referring to? I feel like he's referring to the present, just the present moment. Just translate lull without, outside the poem. If I say, there's a lull here. Is there a pause? A pause, a quiet. Can okay. it also be the melodic quality of someone's voice? Lulling, yes, lulling someone to sleep. So there's, there's, a, there's a kind of somnambulism, a relaxation, a tranquilizing that takes place paradoxically, despite all this exuberance, only the lull I like, the, the loafing on the grass. In this book, the leaves of grass, the leaves being the pages of the book, right? The leaves of grass, only the lull I like, the hum of your valved voice. I almost want to say valved voice, except that he wouldn't be happy with that. Valved voice? We've heard about the stop. Anybody do music? Stops? Right? The stops? Don't, mm -hmm. we, don't we describe the, on a wind instrument, the thing? Or an organ. Also on a, yeah. a string instrument. Or a, tr a trumpet, you have stops. the valves. Yes, valves and stops. The hum of your valved voice. The valve is open. Yeah. So let's uh, quickly look at six, section six. Here we get into the grass, and I really want to understand this. Or I guess, or I guess, I guess it must be the flag of my disposition, or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, or I guess, or I guess. What's he doing with this, or I guess? I think he's setting up, you know, there's, it could be so many different things, and it's like he's kind of saying it over and over again to get at it. Many different, different ways. ways. You know, he, he's not at all Steinian, he's not at all cubistic at all. And yet, his willingness to try to get things right by repetition is very predictive of certain aspects of modern poetry and of modernism generally. He's trying this angle, I try this, I try this, I guess it's like this. Leaves of grass, grass is such an open-ended hieroglyphic, it's such an open-ended symbol. Grass, tell me about grass, quick. Off the top of your head, grass. Covers the entire world. Yes, everything is grass. Max, grass. It's, uh, it's, it's small, it's, 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 it's everywhere. It's minor, it's, it's minor. common. And it's little, little, what, little what? bits that become one big thing. Is it rhizomic? Do the, rhizomic, does it actually attach its, I don't know how grass works, but it's semi-rhizomic. It comes from a seed, right? And they, but they seem to, anyway, there's something about grass that's kind of interconnected, it's true, I don't know what I'm talking about, but, but what about, but what about the, but, but it's a plant, he's reminding us that leaves of grass, grass actually has leaves, we, we mow it, so we don't think of it as having leaves, but the American beauty rose is the rose, is the flower of, uh, of Andrew Carnegie, of, of, of the perfection, clipping all the roses in order to get this one thing, it becomes an American symbol of excellence and capitalism and leaves of grass is the common, it's the ubiquitous, it's, it's really a democratic. Like grassroots, you know. It's grassroots, exactly. We should have thought about that two minutes ago. Grassroots. So leaves of grass, this poem, 52 sections, leaves of grass. Uh, well, 52 sections in Song of Myself, leaves of grass is a lifelong project. So we have leaves. Leaves are the pages of the book, and so they are common. And they are a series of or I guesses, or I guess, or I guess, an attempt to get it all right and to make one poetry of everything for a lifetime. Or I guess the grass is itself a child, or I guess it is a uniform hieroglyphic. Tell me about that. Uniform hieroglyphic. Well, it's kind of a mystery that no one is privileged to, if it's a uniform hieroglyphic. Um, as opposed to a specific 
hieroglyphic. Not that that's necessarily mutually So hieroglyphic means, that word means? Um, well, yeah, a symbol. A um, symbol, keep going. We use it. Like a pictographic a symbol. A, something that requires ciphering. It's a code. It's a message. But uniform, it's a paradox, isn't it? A uniform hieroglyphic, Kristen? Well, because all of the leaves of grass are supposed to be different. They're different, but they're uniform. So he's creating a common commonality out of the many. The leaves of grass, uniform. One common meaning, very much like Emily Dickinson, who is going to proliferate meanings that do not get resolved. This is a uniform hieroglyphic, e pluribus unum, out of the many, this is grass, one, the grass. And it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, here and there, growing among black folks as among right, white. Alike the stars in poetry, the grass is growing under those on opposite sides of segregation and indeed slavery. Growing among black folks and white folks, Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman Cuff. I give them the same. I receive them the same. What's he saying? What's his politics? He's democratic. Democratic. Keep going. Um, well, as you just said, from the many one, everyone is treated equally. Democratic, American, e pluribus unum, equivalence, equality, multicultural. Liberal. Liberal, progressive in the sense that of its inclusiveness. Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman Cuff. I love that. I give them the same. They all get my leaves of grass. This is really, in a way, well, we'll argue this later, but in a way, the opposite of Emily's selectivity um, of visitors the fairest. For Walt, of visitors, the uglier the better, the commoner the better, the more diverse the better. But they also... But you can also have the congressman, you know, he's not being like... It's not just low, events. it's high and low, yes, exactly. Um, let's just spend a little more time before we break on section eight, the blab of the pave. Mm -hmm. Blab of the pave. The blab of the pave, tires of carts, slough of boots alls, talk of the promenaders, the heavy omnibus, the driver with his inter inter interrogating thumb, Back at a bus, back at a bus. I don't know what he's doing, that guy. <laughs> Interrogating thumb. This seems to be a city. The clank of the shod horses on the granite floor. Hey, can you hear that? The snow sleighs clinking, shouted jokes, hey, 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 pelts of snowballs, hurrahs for popular favorites. The theater seems to be let out. Look, there's Brad Pitt. 19th century version, the fury of roused mobs, the flap of the curtained litter, the sick man inside born to the hospital, meaning of enemies, the sudden oath, the blows, there seems to be a fight in the middle of this, the excited crowd, the policeman with his star, let me through, let me through, cops here, look out, police are here, step aside, step aside, working his passage to the center of the crowd, the impassive stones that receive so many echoes, groans of overfed or half-starved who fall sunstruck or in fits. What exclamations of women taken suddenly to hurry home and give birth to babes. I won't try to do the sound of that. What living and buried speeches always vibrating here, here being the city, here being civilization, here being society. This is not a nature poem. This is a poem about people gathered together tightly. What howls restrained by decorum. What living and buried speech is always, there's almost a notion of the unconscious, buried speech always vibrating, what howls, there's the Allen Ginsberg word, there's the lineage of Ginsberg, what howls, restrained by decorum, arrests, slights, adulterous offers, acceptances, rejections, I mind them, or the show or resonance of them, I come and I depart. This is a catalog, and when we continue, I want to talk about the implications of the catalog of the list. So we'll do that. 